Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Masamoto. Uh, thank you for coming. This is fantastic to be here at this uh, new campus uh, because I had the honor of visiting the last campus as well. So it's very nice to be here. And uh, so thank you, uh, Tomodachi, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and having me, having me here. So uh, as uh, Dr. Masamoto told you, I am uh, from University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And when people think Las Vegas, they think bright lights and gambling. However, I wanted to share with you that uh, Las Vegas is not all um, that the advertisements and the craziness of the gambling uh, that happens. So these are pictures from what I know as Las Vegas. Uh, we actually do get snow uh, 50 minutes from us. Uh, we drive up and there's a ski area. Uh, we go down uh, to the Colorado River and jump off, and that actually is uh, Miles jumping off right there. Uh, there's rock climbing uh, within uh, 15 minutes of the city. We do lots of bike riding. And, of course, there's Hoover Dam also in Las Vegas. So it's a wonderful outdoor uh, world as well as the craziness of the, of the, um, the city. And then we do a lot of uh, ac active things outside, and we see lots of wildlife. So we see scorpions. This actually has lots of little baby scorpions on, uh, on her back. We see desert tortoise. We see bighorn uh, sheep. Uh, this is a tarantula spider. Uh, uh, there's some more bighorn sheep. We see rattlesnakes, and then those are my dogs that also uh, hang out there. So there's actually quite a bit of uh, desert wildlife in uh, Las Vegas, and uh, we, we very much enjoy being in, uh, in the desert. Now, uh, I'm going to talk with you about research uh, that I do or that I have done. And the work that I do can't be done without students and colleagues like uh, Dr. Masamoto. So uh, a big thank you to the students that have been uh, part of all these projects uh, that, I, that I have. And very much like you, uh, these folks go to conferences and present. But then we also do some fun things, like we did a triathlon together uh, as a group. And so we work hard and we play hard uh, as a group of students. Uh, students are the key to any good lab, and the students that I look for uh, to work in our lab are students that have a passion for learning. They have a passion for learning. They uh, are very much welcome into our lab. So today what I'm going to do is talk about physics and physiology of sport. Something I do a lot in uh, the classes I teach is I always think terminology is critical. And we need to have um, common terms and definitions so that we all know uh, what we're talking about. So physics uh, is just a definition, knowledge of nature, understanding motion and behavior, and physiology is the scientific uh, study of functions and mechanisms of living systems. These two things overlap very well. So the physics is all about nature, and physiology is how the human works, okay, in, from, in the way that we use physiology here. So I do a physics background of research I do, and I uh, also use physiology a lot. And today I'm going to talk about sport, and sport from a definition is just something that's competitive, it's physical activity, and it has some sort of game associated with it. Now the sport I'm going to talk about today is the endurance sports. And the way that I'm going to present some information here is um, I'm going to rely on a research-based approach to understanding swimming, biking, and running. And I'm going to talk about some specific projects that we've done in our lab and it all comes back to using the scientific method to understand something. The scientific method is uh, an approach used in all different uh, disciplines. We do lots of observations. We ask questions. Uh, we form hypotheses, which are statements we believe to be true, based upon what we know. Then we form an experiment, and our experiment is actually designed to try to refute our hypotheses or disprove our, uh, our thoughts. And then we analyze that data and make a conclusion. And what we are um, looking for, and something I do quite a bit in, is I try to separate out anecdotal information from empirical information. Anecdotal information are testimonies from athletes. Here's the drink I use, or here's uh, the shoes that I wear to run in. That's anecdotes. Empirical information are, are experiments. The anecdotal information is extremely important because a lot of times it drives questions that we want to ask. And I'm going to try to introduce some anecdotes as we go along and show you, show you how those anecdotes actually drove uh, some of the experiments that we have. But at the end of the day, our research approach, we want to do empirical 
uh, uh, based evidence where we actually are conducting an experiment, collecting data objectively, and then trying to evaluate whether or not our thoughts are correct. So this is the approach that we'll take. And I'm going to talk about swim, bike, and run in the research. I'm going to talk about, uh, it's all about triathlon. It's actually funny, this actually has taken me full circle to put this presentation together from when I started in this area. So much like you, I uh, at one point was still wondering what I wanted to do. And I had the fortunate experience to go in and volunteer for a study uh, when I was back in, let's see, it would have been back in 1989. And the study was on uh, cycling and um, hydration strategies. And uh, I had to take this drink, and then I had to breathe into this mask, and, you know, someone was doing this experiment. I was like, this is so neat. This is really, and I talked with the, uh, the person who was doing that study, who I still know today, and she told me about how to get involved with that type of work, and that took me back to school uh, to get my master's and ultimately my PhD. And I was all about, um, at that time, I was interested in learning how to swim, bike, and run faster, and so a lot of the interest that I had in under getting involved with kinesiology is now what I'm going to talk with you about the research that, that I've been part of uh, for the last still 20, 25 years. I'm going to talk about research in the swimming area. I'm going to talk about drag force, muscle activity, core temperature. I'm going to actually talk a little bit about transitioning during the race from a swim to a bike. And then uh, during biking, I'm going to talk about research that we've done on rolling resistance. We're actually doing that right now. So, uh, looking at VO2 and power, cycling power, as well as muscle activity. And then for the run, I'll talk about a little bit of physics, impact forces, some running economy issues with some shoes, and uh, then talk about uh, muscle activity, mostly with body weight support, uh, with the work that I've done with uh, Dr. Massimo. So triathlons are swim, bike, and run, and you do them all in one event, and you have to transition between each event along the way. And so I've always been interested in how to go faster or how to go farther, and now that has actually shown up in the research that I do and what I'm going to share with you today. All right, so we're going to start with swim. So lots of different strokes in swimming. So when we think about competitive swimmers like Dr. Masumoto, who's an ex excellent uh, competitive swimmer. Uh, breaststroking, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just thought the polar bear picture was sort of cool. Um, I don't research this type of swimming. So the type of swimming I'm kind of interested in is open water swimming. So this is where you're in. This is San Francisco. Uh, this is Alcatraz Island, and this is the Golden Gate Bridge. And there's a famous swing where you get off a ferry and you swim back to shore. And uh, it's, um, it's a neat swim, but uh, no uh, line to follow on the bottom of the pool. Uh, no flip turns. Uh, you have to navigate. Uh, which direction you go, and you can see by following this yep, this red line, it wasn't a, an exactly a straight line. So I'm interested in this type of swimming. It's a video of somebody swimming at uh, Ironman, uh, Arizona. Ironman is 2.4 uh, miles, 4 case swim. This is the swim portion, and this is what the swim portion often looks like in a race. The water's murky, this person's doing breaststroke, this person's doing uh, freestyle, uh, cross stroke, and I'm in the kayak actually uh, uh, volunteering and supporting them. And so it's a very different type of swim environment than swimming in a competition pool. And so this is the type of work that I'm interested in. And, uh, so I'm going to go through each of these sports, I'm going to talk a little bit about the physics, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about physiology, and then I'm going to pull together, uh, I'll demonstrate some, or, or talk a little bit about some of the projects we do. So swimming physics, uh, what we do is a kinetic analysis of a swimmer, that's my terrible stick figure right there, but the force, we identify forces acting on the swimmer that include drag resistance, so the force that's, um, that's slowing the swimmer down from water, the drag propulsion, which is the force that allows the swimmer to go forward. Gravity is actually pulling the swimmer down, and buoyancy force is pushing the swimmer up. We put all those forces into this equation, Newton's second law, sum of forces acting on the object equals mass times acceleration. And then we pick a direction that we're interested in, and I'm going to talk about horizontal movement of the swimmer moving forward. So the only horizontal forces that I need to concern myself with are these two forces. 
the resistance to moving forward through the fluid, and then the propulsion causing forward movement. I put that into this equation. Uh, drag force minus drag resistance equals MA. All right? And I'm going to use this equation to try to understand how to swim faster. And so, I So during swimming, this is a picture of the, the same device, each one of these pads measures force. So it's like a force transducer, it's like your bathroom scale, you stand on your bathroom scale, it measures how much force there is from gravity pulling you down and how hard you're pushing on the ground. This is like a bathroom scale, but put this way, so that as the swimmer pulls on it, it's measuring force. This, this is force here, and this is each one of those pads. So this is grabbing the pad, and it's measuring how much force there is. That's the propulsion force. So back to our physics, this is our equation I already uh, showed you. We have drag propulsion minus drag resistance equals MA. I'll put a little check mark over these two because we're measuring that stuff. We're measuring propulsion force and we're measuring uh, mass and, and acceleration. So we have one unknown. If you uh, like physics, we love equations with one unknown. Because if we have one unknown, we can then solve for that a parameter. That's so why I just rewrite that equation and be able to solve for drag resistance. So by doing all these measurements, I can actually figure out the resistance force uh, that's, uh, that's present during this swimming. Now drag force is a fancy equation. I would not be a good biomechanist if I didn't put an equation up. So it looks terrible. But all that that equation tells us is the resistance to moving forward is based on how dense the fluid is, uh, how much frontal area there is, how well the fluid moves over the object, and how fast the fluid moves over the object. So if we know those things, we actually know drag force. But collectively, I'm solving for that already by using this device. And when we use this device, we get data that looks like this. On this axis is drag force, and down here is velocity, or how fast the swimmer is swimming. And in this case, uh, I'm demonstrating data from two different suits that were tested. So this is, and I'm just calling them suit one and suit two because these are these have not been released yet uh, for retail. So we can't, I can't actually tell you what the suits are. <laughs> so, uh, but the suits were, uh, we were trying different things in terms of putting a zipper on the front. Of the, um, of the suit, 
or having sleeves on the suit, which is very common for triathlon, or having a zipper on the back. And so, I don't remember which one this is, which version uh, this is, but we have two different suits, and this is the drag force, so the faster we swim, the more drag force for both suits. But really what I want is the suit with the least amount of drag force. I want the least amount of drag force. So for this swimmer, by being able, by picking suit two, you can have less drag force and ultimately swim faster because they're having less resistance to moving forward. That all makes sense. Well, this is just the way that you're able to measure that. And from this work, we were able to evaluate different, um, different combinations of suits or suit designs that had um, uh, different material, different designs in terms of placement of the zipper or different sleeves, and ultimately able to select a suit that had the least resistance to go forward. And as a swimmer, that's what you want. You want to have the least resistance to go forward, which means that any propulsion force that you can generate makes you go faster. So I, as I go along, I'm going to have these types of boxes. These are my uh, sort of take-home messages. This is the applied part of my work. The applied part means that I'm coming up with answers that are useful. And so from this type of work, uh, we can actually use the data to find the suit with the least amount of drag. Anecdotally, I was then able to uh, pick a suit that worked best for me uh, because I actually I tested uh, some different suits for myself and then was able to say, okay, this is the suit that is fastest for me and it may not actually be the suit that's fastest for anybody else either. So, go on to physiology. So, the other part, so that's the physics of swimming. Now I'm going to switch gears and do physiology of swimming and I'm going to focus in on core temperature because I'm really interested in what happens with how warm we get when we exercise. We get warm when we exercise because we're taking all this chemical energy in our body, our fats, our carbohydrates, what have you, and we're transforming that chemical energy to mechanical energy. That's what causes us to move, generate a force. And we do that aerobically and anaerobically. But this conversion of this energy to that energy is not perfect. It may be 30% efficient. That other 70% of energy goes off into heat that heat ends up heating up our body, right? And that's what we are deal with with thermal, thermal regulation. What I'm interested in is there's different types of wetsuits that triathletes can wear. And anecdotally, triathletes often talk that they get too warm in this wetsuit because it's got full sleeves, it's neoprene, uh, you get warmer in it. That's the anecdote, that's the story. Whereas if you don't have sleeves, the uh, suit comes to here, if the water uh, on your arms and it's a bit cooler. Well, I wanted to test that. So we actually did a study, and we're actually just in the process of submitting it for a, a manuscript, where we did our core temperature um, in these different wetsuits. So the question we're asking is, is core temperature influenced by wetsuit design? How do we measure core temperature? We take that pill, which is like a large vitamin, swallow it, goes inside your, your stomach, and then it moves through your digestive system, and we're able to record core temperature while swimming uh, with that uh, with different wetsuits. And we've had uh, five subjects do this so far. They all had to swallow the core temperature. They swam 500 meters at a self-selected pace in 25.5 degrees Celsius water, which is pretty warm. All right. There's another group that I work with in Norway. They're actually doing cold water temperature effects of swim, swimming in wetsuits to see how uh, core temperature changes. I'm actually in, interested in the warmer side of temperature. So you would think core temperature would go up, but here's what we've seen so far. This is core temperature on this axis. This is no wetsuit. This is the sleeveless <coughs> wetsuit and the full sleeve wetsuit. No change in core temperature. No change. But Here's the time that they swam, 9 minutes, 37 seconds, 8 minutes, 52, 8 minutes, 38. They actually swam fastest with that wetsuit, but did not have a change in core temperature. Which is interesting, because you would think core temperature would have gone up. Two things, or actually a few things that are going on here. Here's my... Core temperature was not influenced by wetsuit design. My take-home message, my applied message is wear the suit that's comfortable, uh, and you went fastest, well, these swimmers went fastest in the full sleeve. Right? That, that was a good take-home message. We've got to be careful, though, because we're only doing 500-meter swim, 
and we're only doing self-selected pities. So the brain is a wonderful thing. That if the brain starts to detect core temperature to go up, the brain starts to say, no, go slower. Don't recruit as much muscle so you don't generate more heat and go higher. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually follow up this study and try to go uh, a longer swim and we're going to go to a faster pace. And our hypothesis is core temperature will go up. And that's what we want to see. But so far, well, with the data that we've, we've looked at, we're not seeing a change in core temperature with swimming in these different wetsuits. So, <clears throat> the other part of this is uh, physiology, is muscle activity. So we were also interested in, anecdotally, uh, athletes will say that wearing a full sleeve wetsuit interferes with shoulder movement. Well, we have a way to measure that. We can put uh, sensors on the muscles, and we can measure muscle activity while swimming in the water which is fantastic because now it's a waterproof system. Dr. Massimoto and I have struggled for years to do uh, EMG in the water, and uh, it's not an easy process. So we did this project. We have people swim in wetsuits, and we got data that looks like this. Uh, this is EMG on the y-axis. This is time on the x-axis. This is the posterior deltoid muscle, so back of the shoulder, and anterior deltoid front part of the shoulder. These are just the correlations between swimming without a wetsuit, with no sleeves on a wetsuit, or with full sleeves on a wetsuit. These correlations are all pretty similar, meaning that these patterns were all very similar to each other. Not perfect, but similar. And same thing, here's the anterior deltoid. These correlations are lower, so these patterns didn't work as, as similar as the posterior deltoid, but still overall, uh, similar amongst the different uh, comparisons. So what, right now what we're looking at is the muscle patterns seem overall similar, but yet there's some unique differences in how these muscles fire with or without um, uh, uh, full sleeves on the wetsuit. So from this work, muscle activity pattern overall seems similar. These lines are parallel to each other. Uh, it was not influenced by wetsuit sign, but there are subtle changes in the wetsuit that might actually be really important. Some of these swims take people an hour and a half to do, so they're in these wetsuits for an hour and a half. Whereas this is uh, maybe eight seconds worth of data. These subtle changes may be small at this stage, but if you do that for an hour and a half, maybe those changes actually accumulate to being a, a big factor. So we're saying right now that, yes, similar, but there are changes in the pattern that maybe over time may accumulate and actually be a factor to deal with. Take home message, wear the wetsuit that's comfortable, and practice swimming in that wetsuit. You need to learn how, you know, how to swim in that wetsuit because without a wetsuit or with a wetsuit uh, can be quite different in terms of muscle activity. All right, so now in the triathlon, we've got to go from the swim to the bike, and so we have a transition. And so you have this wetsuit on, and you have to exit the water, and you have to take this wetsuit off, and ultimately get on the bike. The question that uh, people have had is, uh, should I take the wetsuit off and carry it? Should I take the wetsuit off halfway down? This is a terrible picture. Halfway down, or do you leave the wetsuit all the way up? Uh, and, and transition from the water to your bike. So this is just a picture of where the, all the bikes are. These are diff different runners running along trying to go from the swim to the bike. Well, we actually did a study on this. We had an under undergraduate conduct this study. Uh, what is the best way to run with the wetsuit? We ran without a wetsuit. We had subjects run carrying a wetsuit in the arms. We had the subject wear the wetsuit fully up and halfway down. Very common ways that uh, people would go from the water uh, to the bike. We did 20 subjects on this, four conditions, and we measured uh, physiology, we measured rate of oxygen consumption. And interestingly, oxygen consumption really didn't change much at all for while carrying it in hand or full, but it actually, by wearing the wetsuit halfway down, was about 7% greater than running without the wetsuit. So carrying it, or excuse me, wearing it halfway down, like this picture, wearing it halfway down, was actually the hardest to do. Whereas if you ran with it in your hand or didn't take the wetsuit off, 
uh, you did not have a negative influence on uh, the old two. It was similar to uh, running without the white suit. Down here is stride frequency because we were also interested in did they change the way they ran. And so we measured stride frequency. This is on this axis, and this is the no wetsuit, in hand, full, and half conditions. And you can see these are just marks that there were differences. That if you ran with the um, with the uh, wetsuit fully up, or if you ran with it halfway down, you changed the way you ran. All right. So what's the take-home message from this work? Well, um, well, runners ran different in these different conditions. You need to practice uh, running with the wetsuit or running in the wetsuit. So I actually tell uh, triathletes that I work with is figure out, do you want to run in the wetsuit fully up, which is probably better than wearing it halfway down. Or if you want to take the wetsuit off, hold it in your hands. So you have two real close ways to, or, or quick ways to try to transition to the water. And then I also tell athletes to determine when to take the wetsuit off. Take, do you take the wetsuit off right after getting out of the water and then carry it? Or do you run fully up and get as close to your bike and then take the wetsuit off at that point? Those are probably the two best ways, based upon the data that we have, to run with the wetsuit versus putting it halfway down and running, it, uh, running to the bike that way. All right, so now that was the transition. Now we're in the bike. Uh, portion of the triathlon. And this is some really neat work that we're doing uh, on cycling. Um, we do our kinetic analysis of biking and uh, the first thing we do in the kinetic analysis is we identify the forces acting on the bike just like we did with the swimmer. We have our propulsion force that uh, makes the bike go and the cyclists go forward. Gravity, which is a real big issue if we're going uphill. Then we call that a slope resistance force. Air resistance, which is now the same equation as the uh, drag force that we saw for swimming, but now the fluid moving over the object is air. And then we have rolling resistance. This is what we're really interested in right now. This is that force right here acting on the wheels to slow the bike down. So if we, if we just push the bike and it was able to not fall over, that bike eventually would roll to a stop. And it would roll to a stop due to rolling resistance. And we're really interested in having the least amount of rolling resistance in order to go as fast as possible uh, on the bike. So we take those forces and our kinetic analysis, we put them in our equation. Sum of forces acting on the object equals MA. Here's our different forces. Propulsion, causing uh, forward movement. Slope, if we're going up a hill, it's going to slow us down. Air resistance, drag force. And then the last one, rolling resistance. That last one is the one that I'm really interested in uh, for the work that we're doing right now. The work that we're doing, we're working with this company, Flow Wheels. So we do a lot of uh, partnerships with companies. And we are measuring a whole bunch of things here while riding outside. And the device we're using is this device right here. All right? It's a $10,000 or a 100,000 yen uh, device. Uh, that measures air resistance. It's like a device that would be found on a plane. It actually measures uh, GPS data, so it measures how fast the bike's going, whether or not the bike is going uphill or downhill. So this uh, device and that computer uh, talk to each other. And what we're interested in is um, trying to figure out the least amount of rolling resistance, and we are testing out different combinations of how wide the wheel is, how wide the tire is on the wheel, and how much tire pressure there is. So we're manipulating three things. Okay. So uh, wheel width, how wide that wheel is, how wide the tire is, and how much air we're putting into the tire. And then we use this equation, and what we're doing, let's see if I got it. I'm measuring propulsion force, because actually I have a device in the rear wheel, a uh, power meter. Does anyone have a power meter in a bike? Okay. This is a device we put in the rear wheel to figure out how much propulsion we're generating. The slope resistance force is measured by this device. Air resistance is measured by this device. And mass times acceleration, we're getting from this device that uh, has uh, GPS data. So my equation, I have all those are known. I have one unknown, and that's perfect. Okay, as a biomechanist, that's what I like to have. There's an equation with one unknown. Now I can solve for that. All right? So I'm measuring all those things. I'm manipulating these things, and I'm able to get rolling resistance. 
This is a, a project that we're going on right now. We actually went out and collected some data. We submitted this for the ACSM uh, to present. Uh, we took uh, a bike out and we did one wheel width, one tire width, but three tire pressures. Right, the three pressures we put in the tire were 100 PSI, 70 PSI, and 40 PSI. We did those measurements of, uh, that, that I mentioned in the last slide, and this right here, in essence, represents rolling resistance. We call it coefficient of rolling resistance because that's one part of the equation for rolling resistance, but in essence, it's the force that's causing us to slow down while biking. And the way we did this, we... Uh, we, had, we used a stretch of, uh, of road where we hit a certain speed and then we coasted down and we did all our measurements while doing what we call a roll down test. All right, so what do we have here? 100 PSI, we've got, uh, we normalized the data to this uh, value. Uh, 70 PSI, 95.7% less, or uh, five, about 5% less um, rolling resistance with 70 PSI. But then when we went all the way down to 40 PSI, which is really a soft tire, that rolling resistance went greater than what we saw at 100 PSI, so about 20% greater. So the least amount of rolling resistance ended up being about 70 PSI in the tire. Now, if you're a cyclist, uh, a lot of cyclists tend to pump up their pressure maybe to 120 PSI. We try to put a lot of tire pressure into, or a lot of air pressure into the tire. The data that we're uh, coming up with is you don't want to do that. You actually want less pressure in your tire. You don't want to go too low because now rolling resistance is going to start going up. But you've got to find that optimum range for uh, tire pressure. So rolling resistance lowest at 70 psi versus 100 or 40 psi. And when I get back to uh, Las Vegas, we're going to continue uh, this type of work and do some more. So what's the take-home message? You've got to find the optimum tire pressure. And what I tell uh, my cycling friends and my triathlete friends is you no longer should be pumping up your tires to high pressure. All right? That often was the, the, the thought that you want as high a pressure as possible, but that's not actually the case. You want to have a lower pressure, but you've got to, you've got to be careful not to go too low. So ultimately, that device that we're using now is going to be sold, and people are going to buy that device to be able to do this type of test. All right, so the other cycling work that we're doing, we're doing cycling physiology. So we bring cyclists in the lab and uh, use a trainer and do some work, and we have them uh, uh, breathing into our mask, and we measure uh, oxygen, oxygen consumption. The test that we're doing right now is we do a graded exercise test. This is VO2 on this axis and time down here. And this just represents the graded part of the intensity for the uh, cycling test. The red line represents the power, uh, or excuse me, the red line represents VO2. And uh, this represents a uh, heart rate. And as any good graded exercise test, we see a nice general increase in VO2. Well, during this test, we're also measuring power and that's what's illustrated over here. This is oxygen consumption and power. This is how much power the cyclist is generating. Right? This is how much power the cyclist is generating. And there's a nice relationship between cycling power and VO2. This is nice because when a cyclist is out in the world, real world, they've got a computer that talks to their, their power meter that's on the bike, and they're able to use that power to, in essence, predict what VO2 is and then uh, design a training program around that information. And along with that, our physiology, the other work that we've done is, um, is uh, looking at muscle activity while biking indoors on a trainer versus biking outdoors. Anecdotally, uh, athletes would typically talk about whether or not if you uh, bike on a stationary bike inside, whether or not it's the same as biking outside. So we actually tested that, and we had people uh, bike on a trainer, and then we also had them bike outside. We looked at muscle activity of a number of muscles uh, of the lower extremity, and we had them do a self-selected uh, uh, intensity of three different levels of intensity, and we measured cycling power, and we looked at muscle activity. We were interested in whether or not um, there was a difference in uh, muscle activity while riding on the trainer and over ground. 
This first line is how much power they generated at three RPE levels, rating of perceived exertions. And interestingly, riding in the trainer and over ground, they actually reached the same amount of power for an RPE of 11, same amount of power at RPE at 13, and 15, whether they're cycling on a trainer or over ground. Um, so power increased as RPE increased, and power was not different between training uh, using a trainer versus over ground. So that was actually one part that was really interesting. So they're generating the same amount of power. Anecdotally, athletes would talk that maybe power was different if, uh, if you go at an RPE of 11. We actually demonstrated uh, that that wasn't the case. This slide's a little complicated, but what this is is EMG for the biceps femoris, so hamstrings, rectus femoris on the quadriceps, and vastus lateralis, the uh, outer part of the quadriceps as well. Uh, this is um, the same study. This is, these are data from the three intensity levels on the trainer and three intensity levels while riding outdoors. So same amount of power, indoors and outdoors, at each of these intensities. Um, and interestingly, same amount of muscle activity. So for the biceps femoris, for the rectus femoris, and the vastus lateralis. Muscle activity increased with intensity, both indoors and outdoors. Muscle activity was not different between riding on the trainer or over ground. So this is great information. As a cyclist, that means I can use a trainer and I can simulate outside uh, riding and, uh, uh, by using my trainer. So using a trainer replicate, replicates muscle activity while cycling outdoors. Great take-home message for, uh, for cyclists. All right, the last leg of the triathlon, we're on the run. And um, just like swimming, the running that I'm interested in may not be uh, elite level running. All right, so I'll show this video here, which is uh, down in Ironman, Arizona. I was just watching a bunch of people run. And here's a runner. And sometimes um, both feet are in contact with the ground, sometimes they're not. And this is a person actually walking the marathon portion of the run. So something I like to keep in mind is that the work that I do is not always elite athletes. Sometimes it's what I call talk, working with mere mortals. People like us who, uh, I want to know how to go faster. I'm not running a two hour marathon. Maybe I want to try to get up in four hours. And uh, that is a different type of, um, of, uh, of question of how to run faster four-hour person trying to do a marathon versus a two-hour uh, marathon. All right, so running physics, we do the same exercise here. We identify the forces acting on the runner. In this case, I've got the ground reaction force pushing up on the runner, and I've got gravity pulling down on the runner. We don't really deal with air resistance for uh, running. We can if we have a strong headwind, and that, that, that is actually something we, we have to account for for running outside. And then I put those forces into either the horizontal direction or the vertical direction and try to do my analysis uh, with that. I'm going to show you some quick data for vertical, um, uh, the vertical motion for looking at physics. And uh, to do this work, we have people run across a force platform, which measures uh, the ground reaction force. And when we do that, we get a, a data set that looks very much like this. This is force on this axis. Time on this axis, the person's foot strikes the ground here, and the person's toe comes off the ground over here. And that's a very characteristic curve uh, of a ground reaction force uh, during running. The person hits the ground, and they have to manage that impact with the ground. And one part of uh, why we think runner gets, runners get injured is because of this sudden impact force that we see during running. I've done quite a bit of work on factors that influence that impact force, and this is just one uh, study that, that I'm, I'm showing some data here on. This is impact force over here. This is velocity, and what this uh, data tell, tells us is that as we run faster, the impact goes up. Makes sense. So as we run faster, we're hitting the ground harder. We have to manage that force uh, as we're going along. To, uh, to continue to run or ultimately to prevent injury. Something that the shoe industry has grabbed onto is they are constantly trying to design shoes to reduce that impact force. So we had, um, we recently uh, did a project where we're looking at extreme cushioning shoes, something with lots of cushioning versus a normal trainer shoe. 
And we had an undergraduate student do this project, and this was uh, Mr. Miles Mercer, who uh, this was his project that, that he worked on well at UNLV, and uh, received funding over the summer to, to uh, pull this project together. So this is running a comedy, or running in shoes categorized as maximal cushioning. We were interested in whether or not, um, by running in soft shoes, whether or not VO2, rate of oxygen consumption, would go up, or if it would go down, or if it would stay the same. So anecdotally, people would say, these shoes are heavy, they're soft. We know if you run on soft surfaces, that it's harder. So if you run in sand, or if you run in snow, uh, the, the, the the rate of oxygen consumption will go up. It's harder to run on soft surfaces. So anecdotally, people would say that these were bad shoes to run in. Well, we had noticed that there were actually quite a few people have adopted using uh, this shoe. In fact, if you look at Ironman shoe count, um, a lot of athletes will use this type of shoe in distance running. So we had uh, 10 subjects do this study. They ran uh, three speeds in this shoes. Uh, two different shoes, and they ran 10 minutes per condition, and we measured uh, VO2. And again, this is uh, Miles as the lead author, and I'm the last author, so that's what I need. Here are the data. Uh, this is VO2 on the y-axis in uh, mLs per kg per minute, and this is uh, the slower speed, the speed that they wanted to run at, they self-selected that, and then a faster speed, and then these are the two shoe conditions. This is the control shoe, and this is the maximum cushioning shoe. And what did we see? We actually saw no influence of a shoe type on VO2. What that means is that it didn't, VO2 did not change when we used two different subjects used two different shoes, which is really an important message to take home from this. So VO2 increased with speed, which is very common, but VO2 was not different between shoes. Our take home message, our applied message was using maximum cushioning shoes did not negatively influenced VO2. It didn't make it better, it didn't make it worse. It didn't influence it at all, which was really an important observation uh, that, we, that we made. Um, last category of work I'm going to talk about is body weight support work. And uh, this uh, is where uh, Dr. Massimoto and I have done a lot of work. Uh, body weight support is either running in the water or running with a specialized treadmill that lifts you up while you run. And this is a 750,000 uh, 750, yen treadmill. Uh, 75,000 uh, treadmill. <laughs> that's, that's on its last leg, but we still do a lot of work with that. And you have an expert in this right here, Dr. Masamoto. I would say Dr. Masamoto is uh, the premier expert in understanding physiology and muscle activity of running with body weight support. Uh, he and I have had the pleasure of collaborating on several projects, but he's done more work outside of the collaborations that we have had with uh, uh, wa uh, water locomotion, shallow, deep water locomotion, as well as uh, work on the Ultra G. So I think we need to do a combined presentation at some point on this uh, together. Thank you very much. So it's wonderful to be able to, it's my honor to work with Dr. Massimo on all these projects. I'm going to try to just summarize some of the work that we've done here and some of the conversations that we've had over these past couple days even on some data that we just recently collected. So when we run with body weight support, we know muscle activity and VO2 decrease with body weight support. So when we run with this treadmill that lifts us up, we can run at 50% of our body weight. That's going to mean muscles are less active and I have less rate of oxygen consumption. It gets easier when I start to lift the person up. We know that for each body weight support that we uh, input into the treadmill, muscle activity and VO2 will increase with speed. That's what this graph is showing here. For every uh, body weight support condition, as we increase speed, this line goes up, and those are just different, um, uh, those are different muscles and uh, different body weight supports. Muscle activity patterns, which is sort of illustrated up here with these different muscles here, uh, muscle activity patterns are similar for moderate body weight support, but quite unique when we get to really high levels of body weight support. So high levels of body weight support would be either running in the water, right, where there's 100% body weight support, we're not touching the bottom of the pool, or when we set our treadmill to lift us up with, um, so that we weigh only 
So we can run, so we only weigh 20%. And when we run with 20% body weight, uh, our muscle activity patterns change pretty dramatically. But up until then, our patterns look very similar. Uh, this is the, these patterns are similar, but the activity is less uh, as we run with body weight support. But we actually think that this is an important factor and something we're, we're, we're making some hypotheses right now that we think people can benefit from running with uh, body weight support by uh, telling the brain or showing the brain different ways to coordinate these muscles. And so we think this is actually a neat training stimulus that uh, runners can have by running with even subtle levels of body weight support. Body weight support is a good way to reduce the stress on the body. Uh, muscle coordination is similar for moderate body weight support, but higher levels uh, can be quite different. Uh, so you can use this to replace or augment the run training programs. At high levels of body weight support, muscle coordination changes quite a bit, which may or may not be a bad thing. And that's what we're, we're, we've been talking about over the past so that's sort of my summary of swim, bike, and one run research that we've done uh, at UNLV. And this is just my take-home message for the applied part of the presentation. Uh, use, fastest, use the fastest wetsuit for our races. So if I swim fastest in my full sleep, use that. Don't worry about core temperature and don't worry about muscle activity. It's better to try to go as fast as possible. Uh, Either take the wetsuit off right away or run with it fully up when you're trying to get to your bike. Don't use maximum tire pressure and don't use minimum tire pressure. Uh, you don't want it too soft, you don't want it too hard. Uh, you gotta find that tire pressure in between that actually reduces that rolling res resistance as much as possible. You can use a bike trainer to stimulate biking outdoors. Running in shoes with maximum cushioning does not negatively influence running economy. So pick those shoes that uh, you're comfortable running in and don't worry about that. And use moderate amounts of body weight support. I think is a good way to train. So this is um, a mixture of uh, uh, studies that, well, it, this is my applied message and uh, taken from our empirical uh, data. We do some other work in uh, other sports as well. Uh, I thought I'd put up just two that uh, you might find interesting. Right now we're working with um, some ultimate fight uh, championship fighters, uh, mixed martial, martial arts, and we're measuring how much force they're generating while doing, doing different chokeholds. So um, they were interested in knowing those data, so we actually uh, spent some time to do that. This is just force on this axis. This is uh, just three different chokeholds uh, that the, uh, the um, mixed martial arts athletes uh, perform and we were able to identify which technique generated the most force to be able to chokehold somebody and maybe submit them or to, uh, to have them pass out. Uh, and then some other work we're doing with Cirque du Soleil. Um, we have uh, their artists come in to the lab and then we try to do some movements um, or have them do their movements and then try to do some measurements. You can see he has different instruments on him here. And he's going to do this task, I'll show you in a second, above our two force platforms so we can do a kinetic analysis of this movement. And this was the task that he did. This is one of them. He does this type of movement in a show on Las Vegas. And so he wanted to know what forces he was experiencing while doing this task, as well as some other tasks as well. So he came over to the lab and uh, did this movement and, a, and a, a whole bunch of others as well. So it's sort of a fun project, but very hard to actually study this type of movement because it's so complex. So let me try to uh, summarize this, the applied research that I'm, I'm presenting here. Um, I really uh, think it's important to find things that are, you are interested in. For me, uh, I do triathlons, I enjoy them. I got into kinesiology because of my triathlon experience and volunteering for a subject. You know, ultimately find uh, sports or, or, or activities that you enjoy, and then start to ask questions. Uh, he's always interested in whether or not we got too hot while we swam, uh, and ultimately doing that type of work now. Once you have questions, you have to have hypotheses. So what do you think? Uh, this, is a, this is a line of thought that I talk a lot with my students. Uh, you do lots of observations, you ask questions, you put down ideas in terms of what you think. 
Then you do some measurements, you do an experiment, you uh, check whether or not you were right, because here's your, what your thoughts were, you got to see whether or not your answer matches up with that, and then you ask more questions, and you continue this process, you keep going around and around and around. And if you look at the work that Dr. Vassaboro and I have done, the citations we've done are this type of <coughs> process where we finish one project and we say, ah, oh, what would happen if we did this? And then we would connect, we would start another project, and, and it's actually quite exciting. Uh, to approach for it. These subjects were given. And ultimately, thank you. It's very nice. You know, friends and family is, uh, is important as we go along in our journey of doing research, and these are just different pictures of Dr. Masimoto and our families uh, along, uh, along the path that we've had uh, doing this work. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mosser. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your, your own experience.